So we'll probably still have a few more people coming in. Uh, welcome as you're coming in. Uh, we invite you to turn on your camera if you're able. And we'll start with a welcome from Kathy, who is um, the co-lead with me on this project. So Kathy, if you want to jump on in, you're welcome. Hi everyone. Um, this is Kathy Drager. Just I, I today's topic is about uh, building good business relationships, and I just want to really give a big shout out to all the grocers who are joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, really, this whole body of work is is in supposed to be in service to and supporting grocers as well as farmers. Um, we saw that during COVID, people really realized and appreciated their Main Street grocery stores. And we, we saw that through the pandemic that having diversified supply chains, because these small town stores have a slightly different supply chain than some of the larger big box stores. And that having that supply chain in these small communities was really part of the resilience in our food supply system. Um, so we really just wanted to say that I hope that all of us farmers, as well as consumers and grocery shoppers recognize and appreciate our small town grocers and we really start seeing them and start considering them really, you know, core to the food system and the assets that we have in our local communities. Um, and I, so I just wanted to start out by really reiterating that really building those good relationships, supporting those grocers is a core part of why we do this work with U of M Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. And so um, there's a lot of public good in these small private businesses. So just another hat off to all the grocers that we're engaging with. And we look forward to hearing from you today and from our, our farmers who are on as well about how we can build good relationships at this local level. So that was just the welcome I wanted to make sure everybody heard from us programmatically and looking forward to, um, to our, the rest of our discussions. Thanks, Ren. Yeah, thanks, Kathy, for kind of giving us a welcome and a grounding as we enter the second workshop of a three-part workshop series. And today um, we will kind of Think about um, understanding your own business, personal business model and values and how that relates to local food relationships specifically. Uh, we're going to be investigating nuances around conversations on buying and selling local foods and reflecting on elements that support good business relationships overall. So here's uh, similar to last workshop, we have an uh, inventory today, again, starting with introductions. Moving on to a short presentation on best business relationships. We have a panel with two panelists that will be joining us, Greg Reynolds and Anya Parenteau. And then we have a time for discussion and reflections in our breakout rooms and then closing in questions after that. So introductions. So um, today in the email and last time, um, I asked you to bring a food tool. If you don't have one, that's okay. So we're kind of thinking about anything, any tool that's related to food. Um, so if you want to share that in your breakout rooms, along with your name and pronouns, you're welcome um, to do so uh, in addition to your location and business name and your role. Um, so I will post that into the chat. Uh, here we go. Um, and then uh, Anna, if we have our... Um, Oops, I should do it to everyone. <laughs> uh, breakout room is ready. All right, I think we have everyone back. Is that looking right, Anna? Yes. Okay. Great, and you can still see my screen? Yep. All right. So hopefully you all were able to connect with more with folks in your region area. Um, and hopefully you brought some food tools and if not, that's okay too. Uh, so let's dive into business relationships. I just have a short presentation um, to have, start having some considerations and ideas. Um, so the kind of three different levels that I'll be talking about. The first is thinking about business relationships between farmers and grocers overall. 
Um, then thinking about relationships as it relates to pathways for sales or the process. And then the third, relationships as they relate to conversations or the details and specifics. So let's start with the types of business relationships between farmers and grocers. Um, there are kind of four buckets. Uh, when I was trying to think about how to conceptualize business relationships and farm to grocery, uh, these kind of can connect to different types of interactions. Uh, the first being targeted, um, so single interactions uh, in a similar industry, so um, food industry, uh, and you perhaps do not know that person well or know them personally. Uh, the second type of relationship is tentative, so thinking about this relationship in that there are brief exchanges meeting a number of times each year. Uh, the third, transactional. And this type of relationship is defined by what each person can do for the other. So there's shorter term goals. Uh, and then four is trusted. So there's repeated interactions with this type of relationship with longer term goals uh, and is seen as more reliable. So thinking about these four types from targeted single interaction to tentative brief exchanges to transactional, thinking about what each other can do for one another and then to trusted where you have repeated interactions and a more reliable relationship. Uh, we have a poll put together. And so Anna will put, do you wanna go ahead and put up that poll? Um, and there we go. So if you can um, click on, it should be multiple choice, um, the business relationships that you see reflected within your, your, um, your business and your interactions, your relationships personally. So I see one person's voted. Oh, we have a whole bunch now voting. And we're gonna just see as a group where we're at in terms of um, just kind of, yep, 15, 20. Go ahead and click if there's multiple ones. Just a little bit more time for folks that haven't done the poll yet to go ahead and click on the poll. All right, and I think most everyone's in now. Um, so it looks like the, the majority of folks are in trusted relationships with repeated interactions, um, and longer term reliable relationships. Um, so that's interesting, just kind of a data point to think about um, as more as a whole, as a group, where where relationships are at. So thanks for participating. Oh, yeah, and if you want to make it go away, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so kind of a category of relationships a or a type, um, thinking about farm to grocery and that tr trusted level uh, reciprocal relationships. And reciprocal relationships, you have mutual beneficial exchange of actions, goods, energy, and time. Uh, and a reciprocal relationship can be kind of seen as a ping pong game. So you have you know, two, two people, each with a paddle and a ball going back and forth between the two of them. And there's a rhythm or a flow with that back and forth exchange. And if someone you know, misses and drops the ball, that impacts the other person. So there's a sense of mutual responsibility. And when you're in a reciprocal relationship, uh, you might feel valid, validated, energized, and appreciated. Um, so as this relates to farm to grocery, um, and, you know, it's not thinking about, you know, the impact that um, each, each has on one another and how we can get to, oh, started with that, tar maybe starting with a targeted relationship, going back to th this series and moving more towards um, the trusted or, or reciprocal relationships. So pathways for sale, uh, relationships as a process. There are three different pathways for sale, um, and these are included in the toolkit um, on page 22, if you have that, and if not, that's fine too. Um, so starting with the more traditional type, store buys product from farmer and resells to customers. Uh, so this is probably what, when you think of farm to grocery, um, what you probably think about. <laughs> uh, so the store is determining the markups or margins, and the farmer is delivering as agreed upon what the product is, and the grocer is then bearing the risk of any unsold product. 
Moving on to the second um, scenario for pathways to sale is the farmer, this idea that farmer can rent shelf space. And these are not more non-traditional, so they're not as common, um, but they are potential options, especially as um, a farmer and grocer might be starting out. So with renting shelf, shelf space, um, this means the farmer is stocking and maintaining that display, and the grocer receives a guaranteed amount per month, for example, um, for that retail space. And so that's receiving that amount no matter how much is sold or unsold. And so then the, the farmer would be tracking inventory. So it'd be similar to having like a, a farm stand, but within the grocery store. Um, and then the, the grocer is getting a guaranteed amount per month for renting that shelf space out. And the third pathway for sale consideration um, is the consignment arrangement. So just thinking like a, you probably know more familiar with a clothing consignment shop. Um, so this would mean that the farmer retains ownership of the product until it's purchased by a store customer. And then the grocer would get a straight percentage of sales. And so that means the farmer bears risk of unsold product. And so the difference between the consignment, the grocer is getting a straight percentage of sales, and then the, the sh renting a shelf space is the grocer is receiving a guaranteed amount per month for that retail space. So that's kind of the difference between those two. And then thinking more specifically to the details when it comes to conversations. So we've thought more broadly about different types of relationships and kind of where we're at and what the potential is with reciprocal relationships. Then we moved on to pathways for sales, so three examples. And so let's think about more of the conversations and the details that go into those conversations. The first being purchasing. So thinking, considering um, first and foremost, what type of product is the store interested? So starting at a pretty basic level, um, how much, how will invoicing be handled? How will the price the farmer gets paid be negotiated? Moving on to communication, how frequently will the store need the new orders to be ready? Having conversation about how they're, how you're even gonna be communicating. So are you gonna be texting um, or emailing or calling? What is the best way to, to facilitate that communication? Um, considering how soon the store needs to know about product shortages and communicating about that. And quality, discussing packaging and presentation. So individual items, pack sizes, shipments, how was the product produced? So talking about, is it organic or not? Um, and what does that mean? Uh, what do the co store customers prefer? And this, the grocer can give insight on, so are there different certain industry, in, industry sizes or grades quality um, expected? And then what happens when the store refuses or rejects products? Um, if it doesn't meet certain specifications and being very clear on outlining what those specifications are. And display, so what space does the store have available to allocate to the farmer's product? Is that space refrigerated or frozen, bright light, humid? Um, is there storage that the product will be in before it goes onto the shelf and how will that impact quality? Um, and then how will the product be promoted to customers? And finally, shrink or waste. How frequently will grocery store staff look over the product and call the product that is no longer desirable for purchase? And then what sort of factors play into that culling um, and thinking about individual products and then deciding where the waste will go. Um, in some cases, the farm may want it back for compost, um, maybe discarded or donated, just having that conversation as well. All right, so we have time for questions at the end because um, now we wanna move into the panel to make sure that we have um, plenty of time with our two panelists. Um, and I will move on and I have an a, um, introduction for each of them. So we have Greg Reynolds. Uh, Greg and Mary Reynolds own and operate Riverbend Farm, a certified organic vegetable farm located 30 miles west of Minneapolis. First certified in 1994, Riverbend Farm supplies high quality locally grown produce to store co-ops, restaurants, and individuals. They breed, adapt, select, and produce many of the seeds that they use. And then our second panelist is Anya Parento. And Anya has lived in the Virginia, Minnesota area for about 30 years and has been a member of the Natural Harvest Food Co-op almost as long. Anya has worked as the general manager for the co-op for seven years. And prior to that, she was the Natural Harvest Produce Manager for about four years. Natural Harvest is a small grocery store in Virginia, Minnesota with the sales of about 4 million. The store considers about 20% of the products they sell as local. 
meaning produced or grown within 400 miles. They work with about 15 to 20 local grow growers to supply them with local produce. They also work with many other local producers to sell local eggs, meat, dairy, and miscellaneous other local products. Since 2007, when Anya started working at the store, the store sales have more than doubled. There is now a regular farmer's market in Virginia in the summer, and Anya has seen the demand for locally grown and organically grown products grow every year. Anya sees the freshness, sustainability, and healthy community as important to more and more people. So um, our panelists, if you would like to unmute yourselves. And I have kind of two questions I'll start out with um, for both of you, and I'll start with Anya. And then, and rest of the folks uh, within our group be thinking about questions that you'd like to ask the panelists. Um, and I have some questions too that I kind of sent ahead of time. So I would rather have questions that you wanna know <laughs> as, a, as a group, um, but I also have questions available. So Anya, how did, you first, how did you first start buying from farmers? And did you approach farmers or did farmers approach you? And what were those initial conversations like? Yeah, I think um, I, I can't speak to how it first started, but uh, we started, the co-op started in 1979. I think not until 1986 uh, or something like that, when we moved into our second location, did we actually start having a produce department. And I'm pretty sure from that time on, we had uh, some local growers helping us out um, selling their produce. Um, usually, uh, it is the farmers who approach us. I mean, our de uh, produce department managers or other managers, you know, they have their hands full with everything that they do. So it's really hard to, you know, seek out um, local growers. It usually happens the other way. And it usually just happens with a phone call, basically phone call or email. And um, they will, you know, first of all, say, do you sell local and, and how does it work and what do you need? And um, usually we can give them a good idea. Um, last year was, I think, the first year where we started having basically a growers meeting um, in February where we bring everybody together. Well, last year, of course, was different because of COVID. I think it was the year before where we had our first one. And so everybody in the room kind of like, OK, what are you going to grow? What can you, um, you know, kind of commit to? And of course, there's always um, the understanding that, you know, things can happen, uh, too much rain, not enough rain, whatever it is, and you might not be able to supply, but some kind of framework so that we know what we can expect from different growers and what they can expect from us. Thank you, Anya. And Greg, similar question for you. Um, how did you first start selling your products to grocery stores or co-ops on retail? The very first sales were to uh, a little local food co-op in Buffalo. Um, and they, you know, we just, we had just started out um, growing vegetables on a large scale and kind of figuring out how this farm worked. And we had way too many, um, actually patty pan, summer squash and tomatoes and I went up and just walked in and talked to them. And they said, sure, we'd love to have some local product. Um, at that time, you know, it would be the late 90s or mid 90s. Uh, there wasn't a lot in small stores like that, um, or a lot of local and small stores like that. Uh, after that one, it was probably Lakelands, uh, which would be the nearest, other nearest co-op to us. Uh, same thing, walked in, talked to the produce manager. They were excited to have um, somebody local uh, and I think we started growing arugula for them. There were things that they just, it's like, you know, what can we grow for you? What are you having a hard time? What, you know, what's, what's not looking really good that you're getting? And it was um, bunched greens and radishes. That was, uh, you know, they're very perishable. Uh, you, you know, the, if, if we harvest them one day, we deliver them the next day so that there's, um, you know, a week's more shelf life in them. They have to take care of them. They can't just set them out, but, and, and that worked pretty well. Um, and then it kind of went on from there to all the other co-ops in the cities. And then as Anya was saying, um, we started having grower meetings. It's, it's, well, what else can you grow? What are you looking for? Um, that, and that, that 
built up into a, a much bigger relationship with many stores. Great. Thank you. Are there, um, I'm going to open it up to anyone else who would like to ask a question. You can go ahead and um, type it in the chat. Oh, we have one in the chat. Um, how do you assist with in-store marketing with local growers or food suppliers or, or food suppliers or food producers? So Anya, I'm guessing this one is for you. Um, how do you assist with in-store marketing with local growers? Well, um, basically we love to market our local growers and, our, and their products. And so it is very helpful if um, either the local growers has pictures or even videos that we can use as marketing material. Or we, what we have done is we've done farm visits where our marketing person goes out to the farm and just spends a couple hours there and takes pictures. And so then we, we are able to use those. Um, we use, you know, just something as simple as a sign in our entryway that says, you know, fresh um, local, you know, potatoes are in, you know, anything like that. A lot of social media um, marketing of local producers goes on, but, you know, it is very helpful if we have, you know, met materials available to us from the growers, you know pictures, pictures of their products, pictures of themselves on their farm. You know, if we have pictures of the people that are doing it, that is the, the best and the most helpful to market that. And, and next week, um, this is just a plug for the third workshop. We will focus specifically on um, marketing and merchandising local products within grocery stores. Um, so thanks for that question, Deb. Uh, other questions. We have another one that just came in. Um, what several products do grocery store customers request the most? And Anya, I'm guessing this one's for you as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, anything that we can get local it really usually sells without a whole lot of doing <laughs> just because the quality is usually just so much better so much fresher um greens are probably things that sell the best right away in the spring all through the season though um tomatoes um in the you know late summer when we can finally get some um for us here in northern minnesota you know the challenge is how can our local growers have things ready a little bit earlier than like people and their gardens will have their own produce ready because once um, the people and their gardens have their own produce ready, that's when our local um, sales slow down. So that's just um, you know a little tricky for us as a small grocery store in a small rural area. That so that's just something you know local growers need to know that you know if you can have your tomatoes four weeks earlier than everybody else has theirs, that is a big plus for you. Um, what about local, any like local cheeses or those types of products? Do customers ever rec request? Well, we we don't have a whole lot, you know, that is available in at the, as what I would call the super local level. Um, we do get plenty of cheeses, you know, from Wisconsin and um, down uh, farther south in Minnesota, um, around the cities, you know, quite a few good producers that way. But um, I think the, the, the things that people are most excited about is the more, um, what I would say is very local things, you know, things grown in Embarrass, things grown in Eveleth, you know, things where they actually know the people, know their neighbors. And so for us, that is mostly produce. Great. And Greg, we have a question for you. What is the most popular radish and greens you sell to grocers? Um, the, there are really two radishes for the main season. Um, I grow uh, French breakfast, which is an, an heirloom variety. It's a beautiful radish if they're, uh, and they're fairly small. So it's, it can be um, a learning curve for the customers that usually, you know, being America, this is bigger is better. Well, these are not, these are the size of your little finger more or less. Um, and the other is a round red radish, uh, the hybrids, 
are typically much more productive, that they uh, come up uniformly, they grow uniformly, they don't get um, woody or hollow. So in that, um, as a real standby has been Chariot. There are a few uh, organic hybrid radishes that are coming around. Um, and I'm trying to think Celeste, I'm, uh, but I've grown Chariot for so many years. It's like, I just have someone that comes to mind and it's a very, very reliable. Uh, greens are kind of a different thing. That's um, salads, uh, at least in the cities, have moved to packaged salads. People are buying for convenience, um, but the, you know that anybody here can grow arugula 10 times better than the stuff that's sent here from California. It just, it's by far and away, um, it really tastes like something. Other than that, probably kale, um, La Sonato kale, the curly green kale, um, which are, you know, they both have their drawbacks, but that's what people buy. Right. Um, and then Anya, we have a question about um, navigating shelving and market. How do, how do the co-ops navigate shelving or marketing their butcher counter products alongside other local meats? So I'm thinking about my sausage product versus those made in house. Um, so how do, how do you navigate the local product along with um, other, the, your own, like does the co-op have their own butcher products versus other local meats? Is probably, we need to ask that question. We're too small. We don't have that. Um, so I really can't speak to that. Sure. I think, you know, other stores basically just, you know, have to make sure that there's good signage so that the consumers can see, you know, is it co-op made? I, I would assume that co-ops who cut their own meats or make their own sausage have, you know, a sticker that shows it's house made or has their own, uh, has their logo on it you know, so that the consumer can see where it came from. Um, great. So to both speakers, um, and maybe we'll start with Greg first, do you have any tools, software, et cetera, to help facilitate buying and selling? Um, no, I mean, in, I, I mean in, one side is no, and the other side is of course we do. But it's, I use an email um, that I have everybody's, basically everybody's name listed in the to line and send out a list of what's available um, if it's limited, you know, there's only five cases of radishes or whatever, I put that in there and then how much it is per case. And so the, <clears throat> as the season progresses, the list gets longer and then gets shorter again. Um, and it just goes to everybody and the buyers will, uh, pick out the things they want. They send me a list back saying, you know, two red radishes, um, one arugula, you know, whatever it is, uh, 20 pounds of cherry tomatoes. <clears throat> it's pretty simple. And Anya, do you use any software tools to help with buying and selling local products? Um, no, not really. <laughs> um, for us, it's mostly phone calls that our department manager um, makes or receives as far as um, uh, what's available, what's not available. Usually that happens weekly when things start to get rolling. Um, I, you know, email is great too, but I think the people that we deal with are mostly using the phone and the old fashioned way telling us what's available. Um, of course, our buyers um, are using, you know, spreadsheets and uh, order guides from all the other suppliers that we have, the big guys, but um, that that is kind of the, the challenge is to, you know, incorporate the one to two cases of zucchini that we're getting locally um, into the week's um, worth of zucchini that we might be, you know, supplementing with uh, from California because we don't get enough in. So that's, you know, it's the juggling that department managers have to do. All right. Um, we have a question. Um, are co-op groceries interested in selling started garden plants? Have you ever, or Greg, have you sold started garden plants? Or Anya, have you bought started garden plants? We are selling a ton of um, starter plants. Last year and this year, it looks like a real high demand for home gardening. Uh, I think a lot of people, especially in the cities, were kind of spooked last year when uh, grocery store shelves started to empty out. And um, the interest in gardening really took off. 
but we've always sold um, starter plants that I, um, I'm not particularly shy about saying that some of the plants that we grow are better varieties than, than you can buy at uh, Home Depot or some other hardware store like that. Uh, we have plants, you know, that are locally adapted. They're heirlooms. They're just uh, much better. So, yes, I would say yes, they are. Nanya, do you yeah. have? We do uh, sell starter plants every year. We had a long time a grower out of Duluth um, and she is semi-retiring so we don't have her anymore but we've made a new connection with a grower um, also out of Duluth who's going to supply us with uh, plants this uh, season but yes um, as far as I know um, co-ops are very interested in selling plants um, as garden plants and um, you know we can always use more people who do that. Great. Um, so we have a question about saturation um, of the market. So how would a new producer approach a grocer who is already carrying a lot of local products? Is oversaturation an issue or is there a way to still get new product in that store? And um, Greg, I'll start with you on this one. Um, to answer the two questions, or the answers sure. are yes, yes and yes. Saturation is an issue. Um, one of the other things that, you know, beyond saturation is, that if you're going to approach a grocery store that has a, an established relationship with somebody, you're going to have to try to displace that person. And the chances of that are very small. Um, if they have a production problem, there may be an opportunity for you, you know, all their uh, zucchini got uh, borers and died or something. Um, you can, you may be able to step in there and, and, and fill in and, you know, show that you're a reliable producer. Um, the, the easiest way to get in is to go in and ask them, what are they looking for? And in the, in the produce world, fruit is one of the big things. Local fruit is really hard to come by. Um, and then it's high quality. And uh, maybe you would start out as a secondary supplier and work with them for a while. Kind of, they get to know you. They know that you're not like a ambitious home gardener. You actually got a farm and you're going to be able to deliver every week. And it's, nice clean stuff that's um, holds up on the shelf, all of that. So it's, uh, you can do it. Um, it may be easier um, farther out state where the distribution isn't quite as, as thick as it is in the cities. And Anya, what, what is your experience with saturation? Um, well, we, um, like I said, we work with about 15 to 20 growers and uh, that is about all we can handle. Um, the problem is that everybody, you know, can grow only um, so many things up here. So we're a little bit limited as far to as far as our growing season and how long it is. Um, so you know, we can only have so and so many tomatoes, and we can only have so and so many greens. And when if we have an established grower who can bring us what we can sell and what we need. Um, yeah, it would be very hard to, you know, um, come in as a new grower and uh, try and take that over. So I think, like Craig said, if you have, um, you know, quality products and uh, we know that would be available as a second choice if something goes wrong, that, you know, that's very helpful. But, you know, that is not helpful if you're trying to start out. Um, we've had a couple of people just last year basically contact us and say, how, how can I start, you know, growing for you? And so then the conversation was just basically, well, here's what we don't get, you know, right now we don't get any berries. We don't get any like snap peas or, you know, so it, it, it can start that way too, where, um, you know, basically it's custom, you know, what, what the new, new grower, you know, can start out with. And that was something that we don't have and, and need, have a need for. Um, and then Kathy had a comment um, that she said, I don't know if this displacement is as big of an issue in small town stores. I don't think that these stores have been saturated with farmers offering to sell to them. So Greg, you had kind of mentioned looking at, at beyond the Metro that there might be opp more opportunities in, in smaller stores uh, versus thinking about, you know, Metro co-ops or 
um, something like that. I think Kathy had mentioned, or that was a comment from Kathy. Um, let's see. Uh, grocers, preferences, um, invoice from growers. Could you speak to the process of invoicing? The preferences for that. We like to get an invoice. <laughs> that, you know, we've, we've um, we are, we do teach every year. You know, our new growers sometimes um, that that is what we do need. You know, just an invoice, a piece of paper, is nice thing to get where it's written down and it, the math is done. You know, I mean, oftentimes we even do the math. You know, for um, the growers, they say, you know, yeah, I brought you 15 bunches of scale, and then so then we put, you know. The price in that we pay for them and and do the math and all that when we do pay them but it, it that that truly is you know what's needed especially if you're selling to a bigger store um i mean we're we're a small time we're, we're happy to help in any way we can but if you know it makes it so much easier especially when you're juggling you know 20 different people per week um to have somebody who's organized, who has an invoice, who you know has an invoice number on their invoice, and, and, it, and it's all done. And you know, the only thing that we have to worry about is, well, maybe you brought us 20 pounds of zucchini, maybe uh, 10 pounds of that wasn't you know up to snuff, so then we have to take that off. You know, so we only have to have so those conversations instead of um, you know starting from the beginning. So yeah, it's nice if if people are organized that way. And Greg, what, how do you handle invoicing with stores? I drop off an invoice with every order. Uh, so, and it, it lists what they, you know, what they got. Um, if, if they didn't get something, this is what slide farther back, but if they didn't get something, I try to let them know the night before, uh, a week ahead of time, I, it's in, you know, there's just no way. I'm not going to know if I'm, those tomatoes are going to be ripe next week. Um, but I, you know, but the day before I can, and that gives them a chance to do, uh, I forget what they call it, but there's an order, a shorts order where they, they didn't get something, they can order from somebody else. Um, I try, you know, I try not to surprise them ever. Great. Um, and then Greg, another question for you. Can you talk about your offerings? What percentage of veggies, fruit, um, herbs, flowers, et cetera, do you sell? To retail, we do almost all veggies. Uh, fruit is a is a whole other career. Uh, that if you're going to grow organic fruit, you have to be on top of your game. Um, there's just not enough hours in the day for me to do both of those things. Uh, we do some herbs, mostly basil, things that are in high demand. Um, the problem with the, with like thyme and rosemary and all the culinary herbs is that there's such small amounts that people want to buy enough for, you know, like, I mean, if you're going to buy rosemary, you're not going to buy a pound of it. You're going to buy a tablespoon. And so that, um, that is an awkward one because the stores would want us to package it because that's the way they come. That's what they're used to. Um, and it's, a, it's, again, it's kind of a little specialty thing. And, and uh, the people that grow flowers are really good at it. Uh, one of the things we've had some success with, um, and, and I don't know if it's a metro thing, but edible flowers this year were a big deal because I think people were cooking at home, um, they were used to them, and then uh, there they were at the, at the co-op. But mostly, it's almost you know almost a hundred percent veggies. Okay. Um, we have a question. Um... Uh, for Anya, is storage of frozen products in your store a concern? We'd love to work with local stores, but I'm not sure we'd be able to deliver frozen meat on a weekly basis. I'm also curious to hear more about labeling best practices. What works best in your store to help customers understand the, how the food is raised and what is, and that is local? So first of all, is frozen, thinking about frozen products um, like meat, um, is storage any of a concern and, and like how do deliveries work for local meat products and then labeling best practices and how do you um, help customers understand that's local? Uh, we work with 
just a couple of meat suppliers here at our store and uh, they do not come weekly. Um, we just don't sell enough of their products that that is necessary. And so we can have um, their product in our freezer, you know, for a, a month or six weeks or two months um, and just bring product out as it's selling. Um, that, that is, you know, that is one issue that we have with a lot of our local growers, not just um, meat is, um, you know, if you have to drive 30, 40, 50 miles to get to us, you know, that's quite an expense for you. And um, yeah, how often can you do that? So I think you just have to work with, you know, the particular store that you're working with and how much they can sell and how much they can store. It's probably different for everybody, depending, you know, what their back room looks like and what they can store and how much of the product moves. Um, as far as labeling, I'm not sure, um, you know, what a local meat producer, I'm sure there's laws as to what needs to be on the label specifically. Um, I mean, we just love to have, you know, the name of the farm. And if there's a few attributes on the label already, um, that's great. And if there isn't, then we make, um, you know, signage in-house that would say uh, grass-fed or, you know, organically grown or, or um, somehow market the local producer and make sure that the difference is clear for the consumer. Great. Um, so we have another question about pricing. Um, are people generally willing to pay more than similar item from the wholesaler? Conversely, as a farmer, do you sell, are you able to sell products at wholesale prices to stores? So um, Anya, we'll start with you. Um, do you see customers like when they're making choices on pricing and what they're buying, are they willing to pay more for, this, for a local item that's similar to, to the wholesaler? Yes, uh, not everybody, um, and uh, you know, especially when we're we're talking um, consumers who are just kind of making that switch to maybe a higher quality product or more of a local product, um, they cannot always you know make that trade up and buy the more expensive one or or not willing yet, but you know, slowly but surely, when we educate people um, and they taste it. Um, that they will make that um, trade up as we call it. But yes, in general, um, people who, you know, want the better quality, better taste, um, um, other attributes like less food mileage, they are willing to pay more. Great. And Greg, um, as a farmer, how do you handle um, the prices you're selling at and thinking about the products that the stores are getting at wholesale prices? Yeah, that's a complicated question because uh, there's a lot, and and you know my uh, all my experience is really based in the Twin Cities market, so um, the people shopping uh, for organic food in Minneapolis and St. Paul have lots of choices of uh, where to go. The co-ops are uh, competing with um, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Fresh Time. Um, Aldi, Cub, uh, there are, you know, people, they're, they're competing for people's grocery dollars and price is an issue for a lot of people. Um, I try to come in at or a slightly above wholesale, typical wholesale prices. It's, um, again, I would say it's a better product. It's fresher. It's local. Um, I don't have economies of scale and the, and certainly the co-ops are willing to help with that, that they're, um, they're willing to take a little less margin on our stuff. And then the, you know, the, the question about what are people really asking for when they grocery shop? Well, if they're looking for bananas, avocados, broccoli, you know, those are, have traditionally been the big sellers. Maybe apples are in there too. Um, they're really not local products right, for most of the year. And so the, the stores will take a little higher margin on that. They'll charge a little more. Um, and then, a little less on on our product, so they can pay me more. So that um, that that's a, a tricky conversation to have, but it certainly helps because, like I said, we can't. Um, we're never going to have a hundred acre broccoli field. So right. 
Um, I think I got through the questions on the chat. We have another one coming up. Okay. What resources are used to determine what the going wholesale rate, rate is on commodities? Well, um, the, the easiest way is if you have a relationship with the buyer is to ask them, what is that? How much would you pay for that? Um, a, a rule of thumb is that in grocery stores, and I forget how they, how the margins are, are calculated. It's an odd thing. But if you go into the grocery store and something's on the shelf for a, a dollar fifty, the the store is probably paying about a dollar for that. So you can you can guess that um, two thirds of the retail price is the wholesale price. And Anya, do you have any um, comments on resources used to determine wholesale rate? Um, it, it, for instance, uh, produce, um, you know, changes basically sometimes daily. Um, so it's, it's kind of determined um, by the big um, suppliers that we have and when what they're uh, charging us. And so then, you know, kind of average that. And um, that's, you know, what we usually can pay a local grower and, like Greg said, um, you know, we, we love to pay a little bit more to our local growers. We know, you know, nobody is getting rich um, buying um, uh, growing produce. Um, but yeah, so it, it is that plus it's a combination of what are the consumers willing to pay if they're, you know, if they see an avocado, you know, everywhere else um, for I don't know, 49 cents and we're paying and we're charging a dollar 49, even though that's what we're paying for it now. You know, there is just that kind of reasoning that's like, um, you know, we have to be competitive too. And sometimes we have to take a hit. So it is, it is very complicated. And um, as far as how we work things, we have a, um, a list of um, items that we buy locally, usually every summer. Uh, local produce and we will have a um, wholesale price on there of what we pay um, and uh, so then you know we can of course negotiate with the growers but usually that's kind of the, the going rate that we will pay for a pound of zucchini or a pound of asparagus whatever it is that is locally grown and you know that's stays the same all season long um, every once in a while if a grower just has a glut of something you know maybe we can make a deal and and buy it for a little cheaper so that we can offer it a little cheaper as a sale price um for that item but uh, yeah it's it's definitely it's about talking to you know the department managers and and tell them where you stand and what you can do and um maybe we can you know both take a hit and then somehow make it work um we have a a comment um, from Melissa saying there are a couple online resources, and, and this is in terms of wholesale pricing, I'm guessing, uh, one from Park Slope Co-op in New York City and, and the other main organic growers um, used to have a wholesale and retail prices list, retail price list, which has helped me in the past. So it sounds like there's also some online, online services as well, or resources rather. Um, so we have a question for both of you and we'll start with Greg. Um, can you share your best and worst experiences with your farmer grocery relationships? Your best and worst experience. Oh, geez. Um, we've been doing this for 25 years. So it's like, well, I, um, to sort out a, a good best and worst is hard. Um, so I've, um, I, you know, actually the, the, the hardest ones are well, we, where we will have some sort of production problem. Um, a few years ago, there was a bacterial spot, in, and it comes in. It comes on. It's a seedborne disease, and so we. It was in in kind of coolish, damp weather. Um, it spreads like crazy, and we had just a world of trouble with it, um, and then. You know, the next year wasn't that condition, but then I found that I'd lost um, a bunch of um, sales, you know, that I, I lost in a sense market share because we had that production problem. Um, and the flip side of that is that 
uh, if it's uh, kind of like Anya was saying that if we're just running over with zucchini for two weeks and uh, I can go to the stores and say, hey, we've got a ton of this stuff. Um, I got to pick it and the plants will the plants will decide that they're done if they, you know, if they, they mature the fruit. Um, how about if we do a, a sale? And usually they um, usually a lot of times they can swing that and um We've been able to to work with grocers like that, and it's been great. And it's just really a, a lifesaver because otherwise we just compost them. Mm. <clears throat> um, and Anya, what has been your best and worst experiences with farmer grocery relationships? Uh, it's just making these connections with um, local growers in our area, you know, northern Minnesota, like. I said before, it's just hard to grow anything and it's amazing what our local growers can do and how much um, we can sell for them. And, you know, it just amazes me every year and then every year we sell a little bit more. Um, I think um, I don't have really, I have a worst experience, but um, I think it's the growers also need to know that, you know, what the, what is the consumer looking for? Um, and I guess one time we did have somebody who called us up and said, yeah, we have a lot of zucchini. It's always zucchini, apparently. Um, and, you know, when they brought them in, they were this really big zucchini. And we're like, well, we can't. Nobody wants those. We can't sell those. You know, if consumers want zucchini, they want them this big. And so it just really, really helps if, you know, growers understand what the consumer wants. You know, it's not... Um, because you have big zucchini, that's not what the consumer wants to buy. So um, that's just, you know, being open to that, um, you know, that resource that you have in your local produce manager that says, yeah, I can't sell those. And so then, you know, you need to pick them smaller. And, and that's how these relationships go. Um, we have a comment from Melissa. Um, that says the hardest experience I had was where I told the store what I was bringing, spicy lettuce, lettuce mix, but they mistook, mismarked it as something else, regular lettuce mix. So then customers complained and the store stopped buying from me. That's, that sounds like a tricky situation. Um, any other questions or any that I missed, if you wanna retype them in, in the chat, we could or you can unmute yourself too if you'd like to ask your question verbally. I'm hearing none. Um, well, I have another question, uh, a planned one. <laughs> um, so for Greg, do you give any specific instructions to grocers about your products? No, unless it's something odd um, that they're, you know, they've been handling produce for, you know, years and they have a pretty good idea how to, how to handle it. Um, sometimes there are things um, we tried green shisho, uh, shiso uh, last year, and it was a, a discovery process. I, you know, I had never grown it before. Um, they thought it would work. Um, so they bought it in bulk, like basil, uh, that they found, they found it was really hard to keep it, uh, looking good. Uh, so then we tried smaller packages, you know, clamshells, um, that didn't work. And what, and really what it turned out to be was that it really wants to be warm, like basil. It doesn't want to be cold. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's cold, it wilts right away. And so that, um, that is, you know, it's, if it's, something odd like that, you know, eggplants shouldn't be refrigerated, something like that. Um, so that there are those things. Um, and I have a question for Anya. Um, how do you manage unexpected product shortages? So if a farmer is not delivering upon the greed of product, do you, what do you do in that situation? Well, we are, um, now at a stage with our produce department where we get a delivery almost daily um yet you know we're still three and a half hours away from where our deliveries come from so it's not considered a short um order but um, we do you know with almost daily deliveries can make up for things so if a farmer you know promised us i don't know 
20 pounds of tomatoes and they can't deliver, um, we usually have the option of getting it in maybe not the next day, but maybe the day after. And so every once in a while, we will have an, a, hole, a hole in our display, you know, which we don't like to have, but that does happen. And uh, we just uh, work through that. Great. Um, any other questions for Greg and Anya? Not hearing any. Anya and Greg, any other comments you'd like to make about, oh, uh, packaging. Oh, so someone, okay, so how about packaging? Mm -hmm. um, so Greg, you mentioned like clamshells, like how do, how, how do you determine what your products are, how they're packaged? Uh, we do, we try to mimic the, the stuff that the produce department sees coming off of the, um, say, co-op partners or, um, you know, any other distributor's truck. So typically they're 12 or 24 count in a wax cardboard box. Um, they should be cold, you know, that the uh, temperature is a, has a big influence on shelf life. Uh, for small amounts of packaging, I would really prefer the store does it, but um, we can do clamshells, we can do uh, pulp quartz. It's just a matter that, you know, I have to get them, stock them, pay for them, um, take the time to put the things in there. So I want to charge more for them. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do cherry tomatoes and clamshells for the same as I would do them in bulk. And figuring out that, um, figuring out that extra labor um, and cost is hard to do on the fly. That's, you know, I can't be standing there in the produce department and come up with a price for that because I don't know. Um, there's a comment, my small town grocery store has no sprayers. So I know every green like lettuce has to be in plastic for them. So yeah, I'm really knowing what the store's capability is. That sounds like that's a good way to approach packaging. Um, Can I say something? Yeah, please do. So we do have the sprayers that work either. So when it comes, the produce comes to our warehouse, we wrap certain items like our cilantro and parsley. We wrap those ourselves. That's just part of our own process. And it would be the same if it were from a farmer. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a couple minutes left. Kathy says, I've seen creative packaging for locally grown popcorn. A canvas bag with a historic photo imprinted seems to sell out. Sounds like having some creative packaging can also be helpful for products. You know, there are those products like uh, dry beans. If you put them in a, a windowed bakery bag uh, they, you know, so people can see it and it's, it's obviously a local product. It's not, it's not a mass produced item. People do like that. Uh, that will help sell um, some products. I'm not sure dry beans is a great one because on a small scale, they're really labor intensive to produce. Uh, mm -hmm. so, that, so there's, you know, there's uh, pluses and minuses and all those things. So, Greg or Anya, any other comments or reflections, things that we didn't cover that you'd like to share? I would say that anybody thinking about trying it should just do it. I mean, you know, that go talk to the talk to the produce manager now, the buyer, and introduce yourself. Tell them what you can grow. Um, you. You know, you want to try selling to grocery stores and um, are they willing to buy anything and uh, line up a couple that are, are willing buyers and do your best to meet whatever needs they have. Great. Any last words, Anya? 
Um, no, same thing. I mean, we're willing to, you know, work with um, whoever is willing to grow something and, um, you know, we can make that relationship as good as it can be by just keeping the communication open. Um, I think it's just a good idea to um, have an idea um, before you approach, um, you know, a department manager about what you can do and what, the, what it's going to look like, you know, how is it going to be packaged? Is it um, you have an idea of, you know, what you would like to uh, get for um, a dollar amount for it, you know, so, you know, it, so it doesn't start at the very beginning with our uh, department managers. Like I said, they have a lot of things to juggle. So it's good to, you know, for um, somebody who wants to get started to maybe get a little bit of information from another source and then approach us when you're kind of getting ready to, you know, really dive into it. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Greg and Anya, for joining and sharing your experiences. Um, now, um, you're, you're welcome to go into breakout groups, Greg and Anya. You're also welcome to log off. <laughs> uh, so thank you again for, for your time today. Um, next, we will have our, um, a time for discussion, and we'll have opportunity to share uh, um, individual reflections on the, this um, Q&A panel, and then also your own experiences buying and selling. So I'll put into the chat um, the questions, and then uh, Anna will get us back into the breakout rooms. Uh, welcome back, everyone. All right, I think we have everyone back from the breakout rooms. Um, so we have workshop three coming up for next week. Before we end our time today, we have five minutes left. Um, so I wanted to see if there's any general questions or anything lingering, and you can feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Just wanna give an opportunity if there's any other comments or questions, reflections in the last few minutes here. And if you don't get a chance to ask your question now, um, we do have a quick check-in survey that I'll send out where you can put in any additional comments um, or you can email me as well. Um, and we'll make sure we answer, answer any of those questions from the surveys to, um, on the net, um, to, not tomorrow, next week, <laughs> when we meet together next week. Ren, I have a question. Um, yeah. will, will you and your office be available to offer us technical assistance as we step out and do this? Yeah, so this summer, especially, um, we do have, so this is made possible through the um, specialty crop block grant through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And um, I, I think Alma has been um, interested in helping me and working with me to make, like we wanna help make direct connections between farmers and grocers as well. So in addition to this larger workshop series, yes, we wanna do individual. Um, so please save, our, save my email. Um, my phone number's on there as well. Um, and so we do have capacity. Excellent question. Great. I have a question. Um, I've heard of, um, maybe it's the Rutabaga Project or one of those Northern Minnesota um, Food Hub organizations that have like an inventory and pricing um, thing where you can plug in your information in it. And um, it's, I, I guess, a way of warehousing inventory of what's available and i i want to know more about that and i just heard it from a farmer on a on a i don't know online and i didn't get to get the detail does anyone know anything about yes about that i i work with the rutabaga project we use the open food network open food network open food okay network. it's free and open source and we are using it to for our grocers to order from our farmers. We have both grocers and farmers in these last couple of workshops. And we are using that and we have set up a quote unquote franchise called Arrowhead Grown Grocery Supply that uses Open Food Network. So yes, it's possible to do. Excellent. Also, this is Gwen, I'm just gonna chime in. I think that the Minnesota Farmers Union will be releasing a site pretty soon uh, called the Minnesota Food Shed Project, 
which is another, I think you do need to be a member of the Minnesota Farmers Union, which is like 40 bucks a year. And you can register as a buyer or a seller. And it's a, just, it's another online forum for connecting buyers and sellers. I did a little bit of um, software beta testing for them and it's pretty nice. So that's cool. something, Minnesota Food Shed. That'll be out, I think, this spring. Okay, super. Thank you. Excuse me, but is that also, uh, would a Minnesota Grown be also part of this too? Because um, don't they also have a, a um, you know, a map that shows all the different food? Um, yeah, but it's not, it's not a way to connect buyers and sellers. That's more uh, specifically for consumers to go directly to farms and CSA. Yeah, there were, I think they helped partner with a farmer's union to get this software site going too. So, yeah. Cool. Excellent. So it sounds like the Open Food Network and the Minnesota Food Shed Project. And I can list those. Um, we have a, a resource section on the Google site and I can add those links on there too. Uh, Jane Jewett has used local line. You'll want to ask her about that for the same purposes. Local line. Great. Excellent comments and questions. Anything else? Be looking for an email from me and I'll have a, a quick like four question survey check in. Um, and again, we really appreciate your time being here and thank you, Anya and Greg. Um, and we will see you all last week for the last session when we are doing merchandising, um, product handling um, and marketing. Great. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.